Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Lady Chairman. Um, so I'm not going to say anything definitive here today about pre-operative chemotherapy because the truth is we don't really have definitive data. Uh, I'm going to review some of uh, the evidence that's available to us. Uh, you've heard another piece of uh, evidence just presented. Um, to try and uh, give us a glimpse into how we might use preoperative chemotherapy in the future, it would certainly be my view, and I think the view of many people in this room, that a lot of patients with rectal cancer are essentially overtreated. Uh, they're receiving chemo when they don't need it, they're receiving chemo rad when they don't need it, and maybe they don't even need as, as extensive surgery. Um, just to summarize again, the importance of the location of the tumor uh, within the rectum is best exemplified here uh, uh, by the Dutch TME uh, trial results. And this uh, refers uh, to the, 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 the group of patients who received surgery without radiotherapy. And it, it is notable that, that, as you've heard, the CR, CRM rate uh, for the tumors low in the rectum is relatively high. Approximately 25 to 30% is reported in many series. In fact, the local recurrence rate is, is lower uh, than the TME uh, a positive rate for a variety of reasons. Some of these patients get radiotherapy. Uh, some of those patients develop systemic disease. Uh, uh, but there is a clear correlation. Now, when it comes to deciding on what should be uh, uh, the choice for a preoperative strategy, be that uh, local or systemic therapy, I think the case for the low-lying tumors is quite strong because even if they have a relatively good prognosis with respect to systemic spread, we know that they're at a high risk of uh, local failure. Furthermore, with those patients in whom there's a high lymph node burden, uh, with or without extramural venous invasion, then there's a high risk of distant recurrence. Um, but also, there's, there's a group in the middle there, the, the CRM positives, or the T3Cs uh, greater than 5 millimeters, where there's a risk of both local recurrence and systemic failure. And in these patients, the two are interlinked. Advantages and disadvantages of radiotherapy uh, have been, I think, clearly uh, summarized. But just to, 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 to show this again very briefly, um, clearly, we can make the tumor smaller, uh, and we can downsize and downstage with a preoperative strategy, which is good. But we have heard about the acute and mid and, and long term toxicities, uh, including bowel function, sexual function, increased risk of second cancers. And um, from the Dutch trial, anyway, if you, if you apply a preoperative strategy in an unselected way, you don't really uh, improve survival, which is, uh, of course, well illustrated here. So depending on your risk of uh, local recurrence, you will approximately reduce that risk by about 50% uh, using preoperative short course radiotherapy, as in the Dutch trial. But what you don't seem to impact on in an unselected way uh, is, is, is uh, survival. So, where does chemotherapy fit in in this? Now, I think the first thing is that I'm a bit anxious about treating people with chemotherapy who really don't need chemotherapy as a component part of their general treatment plan. So then we must ask the question, is there evidence to support the use of systemic chemotherapy after surgery in rectal cancer? Um, and uh, my colleague uh, earlier uh, cited the Cochrane Collaboration uh, publication of last year. And essentially, analyzing this was nearly um, 8,000 patients, uh, they did show that there was a significant uh, improvement in survival. But I draw your attention to the hazard ratio. It is relatively small. Uh, it's important, but it's small. And this is for both Dukes B and Dukes C. If we drill down into the Quasar trial, uh, which constituted about um, a significant number of patients in that rectal cancer uh, subgroup analysis, 
we find a couple of interesting things. Firstly, within the stage two, uh, there was the separation in the survival curves. And this is using 5-FU and flinic acid. It's not a chemotherapy doublet. Secondly, uh, you can also see uh, there was a significant impact in this trial in Duke's B patients uh, from the use of uh, a chemotherapy after surgery, particularly in the patients under the age of 70. And when they looked at patients over the age of 70, that benefit seemed to disappear. Now, as you know, age is a continuous variable. And so it's in a subset analysis like this, this doesn't tell us as an absolute you shouldn't offer patients over the age of 70 chemotherapy. But it does tell you, at least on the basis of these data, as patients get older, the extent to which they benefit from chemotherapy gets smaller. So, if adjuvant chemotherapy is potentially beneficial given after surgery, um, why not give it preoperatively? So, the first thing I would say is that I'd want to think about the people who are likely to benefit from doublet chemotherapy. You could use single agent uh, fluorouracil or capecitabine. But generally, people are offering doublet chemotherapy to patients uh, with rectal cancer. So I'd be looking at patients who are node positive, um, patients who are under the age of 70, and patients who clearly have good performance status. Also, patients who might be candidates for chemoradiation to downstage and downsize the tumors. Actually, this is a very interesting French study. And it's a very simple message. If you look at this, this uh, phase two study in which they compared preoperative with postoperative chemotherapy, as we found really throughout the gastrointestinal tract, if you give chemotherapy before surgery, in general, you can give more of the treatment, you get better dose intensity. So I think we all appreciate that as a, a, there's a sound rationale for this approach. These are uh, two studies from uh, my own institution. Uh, we've been engaged in preoperative chemotherapy. We've actually done three series of randomized uh, phase two studies. And the most recent was the expert C trial uh, in which um, we explored the additive benefit of cetuximab to four cycles of capecitabine and oxaliplatin followed by chemoradiation, essentially in, in patients who were very high risk, I think uh, in contradistinction to the, the last presentation. I may also add that within this trial, we did introduce uh, prophylactic low molecular weight heparin because of the risk of pulmonary thromboembolism. These patients with large pelvic tumors who get chemotherapy, which is prothrombogenic, are at significant risk of thromboembolism. And uh, the point about these uh, data were really quite simple. Uh, again, uh, supporting uh, the previous presentation, most of these patients respond to chemotherapy, symptomatic response. Most of the patients demonstrate tumor regression and progressive disease on treatment is quite uncommon. And that was one of our main concerns about this. I may add in the expert C trial, where these patients had chemo for 12 weeks, chemo radiation for six weeks, the pathological CR rate was only 15%. And pathological CR is a function of how well you look for path CR and also the size of the tumor to begin with, as well as intrinsic chemo and radiosensitivity. So the advantages of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, of course, is that very often we give our chemo treatments to patients entirely blind. We don't really know if that chemotherapy will help that patient. So it does allow us to assess the benefit of chemotherapy within the patient. It also, of course, permits the early treatment of micrometastatic disease and therefore the potential to improve survival. Now, this is, this is not meant to be what we should be doing. I think this is about what might actually you know, trig, at least stimulate us to think about where we can apply and, and research preoperative chemotherapy. Because remember, nobody's done a trial of pre versus post op chemotherapy. Um, and so the first thing is that I'd be looking at people where 
we can give a doublet chemotherapy to because the, the response rate to, to single agent treatment is relatively low and I'm not sure that'd be good enough. So the node positive patients, we could certainly consider them. I think I'd be looking at the younger patient age group because in any event, most of us wouldn't give these patients a chemo doublet postoperatively. We can argue the point. Um, I think that certainly patients with good PS, certainly patients with CRM positive, although arguably that's a group where par excellence chemo radiation should be a component of therapy. And of course, those patients where there is a risk of both local failure and systemic spread. So I think that this is really to, to, to allow us to gather our thoughts and, and consider how, as we move forward, we may apply the strategy in a rational way so that we can actually improve our outcome for, for patients. Um, I think, of, obviously, if the CRM is still positive after uh, four cycles of chemotherapy, uh, the, it would be highly appropriate and in a, to, to proceed with chemoradiation and then proceed to surgery. And in fact, Rob Glenn Jones, who's in the audience, you've heard him ask a couple of questions. Uh, this is a, a trial uh, of which he's uh, 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 the lead investigator, and we're collaborating with him at the, the Royal Marsden. And this is a very interesting trial design, although it is not going to answer the question about preoperative chemotherapy. It will add to the evidence and perhaps the help us select subsets. So it's a very simple question. Is a chemotherapy doublet plus bevacizumab, uh, is, or, or, sorry, is a chemotherapy triplet plus bevacizumab better than a chemotherapy doublet plus bevacizumab? And what they've done that's, that's quite clever is they've, they've integrated uh, into this an early assessment of response with positron emission tomography. And if we take the lessons uh, from the upper GI tract, I think this could be a very useful tool and it'll be interesting to see if it's validated within the context of this study. So essentially, if patients don't get a response, uh, they come off trial and, are, and receive chemo radiation. If they do, they continue for 12 weeks of treatment and then uh, have, an, have an operation unless it's deemed appropriate uh, to offer chemo rad. What they've done in here, of course, is they've, they've excluded in, in this particular study the CRM positive group, and they felt that those patients would not be candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, at least within the context of this trial. There are uh, some uh, available data uh, um, on uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I've presented you the data on the expert and expert C studies, but they also had chemoradiation integrated into them prior to surgery. Uh, and this is, is a, a study published in 2010. And I think the take home message here is that in, in this particular trial, uh, the PATH uh, complete remission rate uh, was 4%. There was quite a lot of missing data, for example, what the CR CRM rate, uh, rate was, and it's a very small study. Um, this, these are data presented at ASCO. I've not yet seen them published uh, from the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Again, a small number of patients uh, who are treated with Folfox and Bevacizumab. Uh, Take home message, well, uh, the interesting message is that in this particular study, there was a 27% pathological complete remission rate. They too reported uh, a death. They had one out of uh, 30 patients died on treatment because at least in, in, in the, the, the poster was not uh, uh, provided. So an early study needs a bit more follow-up, but it does reinforce the case that you, you don't get treatment failures, you can get PATH CRs, and this is clearly a worthwhile uh, uh, approach. So I think uh, uh, my conclusion, Mr. Chairman, would be that I think a stratified uh, approach to rectal cancer is feasible, and it's the reality. I mean, at the moment, we're salami slicing uh, malignant disease on the basis of molecular profiles, gene mutations, uh, amplifications, etc. I think we should be able to stratify this disease on the basis of stage and risk of local failure and systemic relapse. 
I think that surgery alone is, is, and certainly in our institution, is, is routinely employed as a single modality for patients where we deem uh, the risk of local failure to be low, and then the decision about post-operative treatment is very much dependent on the, the histopathology. However, there are many patients where a multimodality approach is, is of benefit. And as we've heard, uh, not just the people with locally advanced disease, but also the patients with early disease, where the, 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 the priority is sphincter pr preservation. I find it hard to believe how we could move away from radiotherapy for the low tumors, where they're quite small, and the main risk is local failure, but that's an arguable point. But neoadjuvant treatment can be explored for a number of subsets of patients uh, with this disease, particularly those where you would be thinking about offering post-operative chemotherapy or where you're thinking about chemo-rad to downsize the tumor. Thank you very much.